to ask any question, please just interrupt. Um, our speaker would very much like to have lively discussion. Um, otherwise, uh, type them in the chat or raise your hand at the end of the talk and I will do the moderation. All right, so we are very pleased to have Professor Smother Nose from UCLA, who is a Howard and Astrid Preston term chair in astrophysics. Smother works on anything and everything that is related to dynamics and astrophysics, from planets to all the way to large scale structures. Um, she is an award-winning astrophysicist with a very long list of distinctions. I would rather not just list them all, um, but I would just like to say that includes Helen B. Warner Prize from WAS uh, very recently in 2020. And not only is Smother a phenomenal scientist, um, she has also led many successful EDI initiatives at UCLA and in a wider community, including the Division on Dynamical Astronomy. I've always learned so much about science, academia, and leadership from speaking with Smadar since we've met many years ago. And it is my great pleasure to introduce her as our seminar speaker. So without further ado, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eve, for the lovely introduction. And thank you for having me. I wish I could be with you all there in person. I know that uh, Zoom talks are kind of funny, and I'll try to be as engaging as I possibly can. Um, and please feel free to ask me as many questions either in the chat or just interrupt me if I don't see the chat for a, a moment because I got caught on and exciting something that I'm telling you. Uh, so please feel free to interrupt me. It's more, it's it's just funner if, you, if you'll be there with me. Um, all right, so we can start and Indeed, as, um, as Eve said, my research cover a wide range of topics from structure formation of the very early universe all the way to the dynamics of planets and stars and black holes. And there is one thing that uh, connects everything together, which is physics and specifically gravity at different scales. And this is what I think that astrophysics is all about. We're solving different physics problems at uh, different astrophysical settings. And in this talk, I'm going to focus on one astrophysical setting, which is the heart of galaxies. And I'm going to show you that it's a natural place to find many gravitational wave sources and lots of interesting uh, exotics in this place as well. So what I'll do is I'll start by talking about some of the challenges of merging black holes, right? If I'm saying that the that this center of galaxies is interesting to form to find gravitational wave sources, maybe the first question is why look for help or different channels to form gravitational wave sources? What's so interesting about that? And then I will just describe some of um, the properties around the supermassive black holes. And we will describe the physical processes that take place in these places. And we will find different exotics like stellar mergers and gravitational wave sources. And we will try then to find different ways to disentangle between different channels, which I think is an important job of a theoretical astrophysicist. Um, here I wrote a list of some of my collaborators. It's not a complete list, and I, but I do want to highlight my group. So this is my group. Um, I know it's not a very updated because you can see Cheryl here. Cheryl is a new student in, um, in McGill's university, and she was an undergrad in my, uh, in my group last year. Um, this is everyone here are very um, professional looking, I would say, but during COVID time, mostly we just were meeting online and trying to make the most of it, I guess, like everyone. Okay, so um, I will highlight the work that my students are doing as, um, as we evolve and you'll see their pictures popping up. Unfortunately, I cannot talk about all of their works because it really covers a wide range of topics. Um, so let's just jump into it. And um, as many of you know, uh, LIGO really transformed the way that we sense and understand uh, our universe. We no longer need to rely on the electromagnetic uh, counterparts, and sorry, electromagnetic spectrum to be able to sense our universe. Now we can see it through gravitational wave or feel it or sense it through gravitational wave emission. Gravitational waves are the waves that happen uh, that take place in the space-time continuum when two masses accelerate to one another. And I don't know how well you see this uh, video here. Maybe you see something, maybe you don't see the video. I know that Zoom is annoying. Um, 
But what I do want to uh, draw your attention here is to this illustration. And this illustration, the y-axis are massive, the x-axis is arbitrary. We see the merger products in, here in blue and also in orange for the neutron star. So the blue, which I want to draw your attention to, are the LIGO Virgo black holes. And you can see two that are merging together to become one. So this one and this one merge to become this one. And maybe the very first thing that we can see is that there are so many blues here, right? And in fact, LIGO estimates that almost every 15 minutes, black hole, black hole merge in our local universe. And that is pretty amazing. And it's even more amazing when you consider the fact that before LIGO Virgo made their detections, um, a lot of people did not expect that result. In fact, even some people thought that, there, that LIGO will observe exactly zero black hole, black hole mergers. So what I want to do next is um, try to explain some of the challenges of merging two black holes. And I'm going to offer some ways to overcome these uh, challenges. So this is going to be a very heuristic uh, view of how we merge two black holes. It's going to be a recipe, so we need a chef. And we need two, black, uh, two stars, because we think that these black holes are the remnant of, of stars massive stars above 20 or 30 solar mass that evolve and then uh, explode through a supernova and leave behind a black hole. So we need two stars. So maybe the first question that we want to ask ourselves, do stars come in pairs? And the answer is yes. And here is Tatooine um, from Star Wars. And of course, you know, we are near Hollywood. So if it's correct in Hollywood, it's correct in real life. Um, by the way, I like to tell jokes. I'm not very funny. Um, but I'll do it anyways. Um, and I know that it's hard to see in Zoom if anyone laughs, um, either with me or at me, depending how not funny my joke was. But feel free to laugh at those jokes. It will make me feel much better. <laughs> All right, so we know that we have uh, the stars come in binaries. I will quantify this binarity part later, I promise. Um, and let's see what happens. So as stars evolve, they go through um, midlife crisis uh, sort of thing. They start to expand a little bit around the around the <laughs> around the sides uh, as they exhaust their hydrogen, and they um, basically become larger. And in this cartoon here, um, I've I've drawn one of the stars a little bit too close to the other star, and what happened is that they start to eat one another. And this eating part is something very common that we expect to happen uh, in our local galaxy, in our local uh, neighborhood pretty often. This is of course a, um, this is of course a artist illustration. It's not a real thing. Uh, but we see a lot of uh, a lot of stars going through common envelope phase. This is how it's called when they start to eat each other. And the consequence of that is that they will become one star and therefore one black hole. And that's not good because I wanted two black holes. But the answer is really easy. All I need to do is take the two stars initially and put them further apart. This way, each of them will evolve separately by itself. And here we go, I got two black holes, right? Now it turns out that in order to overcome this um, mutual eating phase, and in order um, to, over um, to get through all this stellar evolution where I lose a lot of mass that widen the orbit, also through supernova that will even widen more the orbit, these black, the remnant black holes are so far apart that it will take them longer than the age of the universe to merge through a uh, gravitational wave emission that takes away a little bit of energy until it merges them. So that doesn't work. And this was the main reason why people did not expect that LIGO will observe so many black hole, black hole mergers in our universe. And we need to help them somehow. So how do we help two black holes merge? So a popular idea is to look at the dense stellar clusters such as globular clusters. And you may have heard of um, those ideas. And globular clusters are particularly interesting because they are they're very old objects and they full of stellar remnants. So we expect that they'll have lots of black holes. Now, also, I don't know how well the movie works in a Zoom environment. For me, for example, it's completely frozen. The idea is that they are 
two, um, two objects that are on a binary configuration and they come back and forth, back and forth with a tertiary. And maybe you can see my, my hands better. Here is a binary and there, is, there comes another one and then I get a new binary and a new binary is formed and destroyed again and again. And every time the new binary is tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter until it merge. And I have also a snapshot here and you can see the snapshot um, of this mess behaving um, here. And the idea is that this is a great way and I have almost a Hubble time uh, to basically merge these two things together because these objects, the globular clusters are very old. So this seems very promising to merge and able to, you know, to help two black holes merge together. So we thought if we're looking at densest and dense places like globular clusters, why not look at the densest places that there are, which is around supermassive black holes. And this is where our particular story begins. And we know that around that at almost every galaxy, there is a, at the center, there is a supermassive black hole with masses between millions to billions solar mass. And surrounding these supermassive black holes are very dense environment of stars and stellar remnants. And that means that if I have, um, if I have a, um, an, a binary or a star in this environment, not only it will feel the gravitational potential of the supermassive black hole, but also it will feel all the interactions from nearby stars and the stellar remnants. Luckily for us, we have a monster such as this in our own backyard and very detailed observations found that it has a 4 million solar mass. It's called Sagittarius A star. And as you probably know, it yielded a Nobel Prize in Physics in 2020. Um, and I specifically want to highlight Andrea Gaz from UCLA. We are even though it was in the fall of 2020, we're still in the, sorry, it wasn't in the fall. Yeah, it was in the fall of 2020. We're still in the mode of uh, celebration here in UCLA. We're all extremely happy and proud for Andrea. And um, of detailed observations such as uh, she did really revealed the nature and complexity of this dense place. And we can infer that the properties that we see in these places can take place everywhere else in the universe because we cannot be very special, right? I know it's shocking, but our place probably is not the most uh, unique place and important place in the universe. So now the very first question that we should ask ourselves in these specific places is, are there binaries in these places? So now it's time really to quantify, what do I mean by a lot of binaries? So, Let's back a little bit. Let's go back to Tatooine. And we know that in the field, stars like to born in binaries. So here I'm showing the fraction of stars with companion as a fraction of the spectral type. This is uh, sun-like stars, right? So our sun had a 50-50 chance to have, um, to have a companion. And one can think of whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing that we do or don't have, uh, that we don't have a companion. Um, but more massive stars, the stars that we care about that will become at the end black holes, most of them, if not all of them, are in binary configuration in the field and in young stellar clusters. Now you can say, okay, fine, but this is in the field in young stellar clusters. Who to say that the galactic center is the same environment and stars are formed similarly there, which is a Really great question if this is the question that popped into your head. And these are very complicated uh, observations to do to really find uh, binaries in the galactic center. And luckily for us, already about three binaries, not about exactly three binaries were found. And that's an interesting achievement. And it's a great achievement because again, these are extremely complicated observations to do. And I, I'm not doing them right. So I can, I know for sure that they are. Um, and from the candidates that we have and uh, estimating the, compl the completion, um, the estimation is that the binary fraction of massive stars may be comparable to that of young stellar clusters or even larger. And I just said that in young stellar clusters, most if not all massive stars are in binaries. So that's very encouraging. Uh, we also have lots of hints um, and signatures of binaries. For example, there are plenty X-ray 
X-ray binaries. You can see the McGill's um, connection over there as well. And I'm pointing, you kind of see, I should do it like this. Um, and the key word is, uh, is binaries, of course. So if there are lots of X-ray binaries, they somehow came to their binarity configuration. There are also lots of um, hypervelocity stars. So I, this is our first uh, introduction to one of the physical processes that we're going to consider. Um, it's called the Hales process. When I have a supermassive black hole with a binary coming and wandering a little bit too close to it, it can come so close that the supermassive black hole break the binary apart. It takes one member and put it in a very tight configuration. Another one, it shoots away on the extreme velocities. And we call those hypervelocity stars. And there's some evidence of these stars exist. And, um, and it might be that indeed they came from, uh, from binary configuration. And lastly, some interesting uh, morphological configuration of the stellar disk. So there are some stars in the galactic center that appear to be in the disk. And from the orbital properties, one can explain them through um, high fraction of bin binaries in there. So in general, I think that we can say, or have Dr. Seuss says it for us, that binaries are here and there, and binaries are everywhere. So that is good. All right. So now here is a binary in the galactic center. And the question is, will it merge? Right? So we established that binaries should, should exist there. And now we want to ask if they merge. Now, I said often that this galactic center and galactic centers in general are extremely dense environments, and I didn't quantify it. So let's try to quantify it now. So here is an image of the center of our galaxy. Somewhere over here lurks the supermassive black hole. And I want to compare it to our own, um, own neighborhood. So here is our sun. And about one parsec from us is our closest neighbor, Proxima Centauri. And it's, by the way, a triple system. And between us and our closest neighbor, there is nothing, right? There are no other stars. This is our closest neighbor. If I will look at a similar volume of about one parsec around the supermassive black hole, I will find a million stars. So this is really quantifying the difference in densities between, um, between us, for example, and the, super, and the environment of the supermassive black hole. Just imagine the night sky with million stars between us and Proxima Centauri. Um, so if we go back to our question whether or not they will merge, the first thing that we need to consider is what do all those other stars do? And what they do is that they interrupt. They really are, in a sense, annoying. Um, they try to unbind the, to unbind the binary. As time goes by, they produce very weak kicks on the binary itself until it breaks it apart and unbinds it. And now you may think the following. You may have in your head and you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You began this talk and you uh, talked about global clusters. And there we had a binary interacting with a single and it became tighter and tighter and tighter. And now you have a binary interacting with a single, single, single single and it become wider and wider. So which is it? Make up your mind. This is a great question if this is the question that you have in your mind. Um, and the answer is both. It happened, both of them take place. What is happening is that we need to compare the binding energy with the kinetic energy of the incoming star or the incoming object. And the, in other words, we're comparing the um, we're comparing the escape velocity of the, of the binary to the dispersion velocity, the velocity dispersion of the cluster. So there is another wrinkle here is that I want to start with two wide stars and let them evolve to become a black hole or two black holes. While in the global air clusters community, they start already with two black holes that are in tight configuration. So they are tighter or harder compared to the uh, velocity dispersion of the global cluster. Here, it's wider, weaker, or softer binary. And what will happen is that as time goes by, it will become softer and softer. And that is fine. We can work with this. We can try to estimate what is the relevant time scale that this will take place and compare it to other physical processes that take place in the system. 
this is work that was done by one of my students, Tanaya Rose. Um, and this is a very busy plot, so I'm going just to highlight the important stuff here for our discussion. So everything here is important, of course. <laughs> so here I'm showing um, the timeline, the y-axis, and the distance on the x-axis. And we can see the unbinding time scale here in purple. And in this white, um, lighter purple, we see the time, the characteristic time scale of the gravitational perturbations from the supermassive black hole, which I'm going to quantify in the next slide. So we see that some interesting things, I'm sorry if you hear my dog barking in the background. Um, uh, the, we can see that in a large part of the parameter space, the gravitational perturbations from the supermassive black hole happens faster than unbinding due to, um, due to the interactions with other, with other stars. We are going to take that as a, into, uh, into account and so now I generalize this for an arbitrary orbit, so we're going to be able to do it. And we're going even to be more conservative and really try to confine ourselves. So part of the discussion to being inside 0.1 parsec. And later we're going to generalize that a little bit more. All right, so now we know that we can deal with a dense environment. Now let's try to understand what does the supermassive black hole do? Um, so here I'm, um, this is our same, the exact same behavior. I have two a system, we have two black holes. They're orbiting one another, center of mass. And then together they're orbiting the supermassive black hole um, uh, free body center of mass. And in order to avoid scattering between them both, so to unstable, to make the system completely unstable and these two go to somewhere else or becoming this tail mechanism, what they need to do is really to separate the orbit. So these two to be on a tight configuration and the orbit around the supermassive black hole be on a wider configuration. Um, I can write the Hamiltonian of the system and I can recognize different parts of the Hamiltonian. For example, this part here is the inner orbit Kepler energy, right? So we have here Kepler energy. And this one here is the Kepler energy of the outer orbit in blue. So there's uh, some color coding here. And here, this is where the fun happens. This is where we've done an expansion in semi-major axis or separation ratio, because the ratio of the, of the smaller, of the tighter orbit to the wider orbit is a, is a small parameter if I did the separation of scales correctly. And here there is some factor of masses hiding here, and this is Legendre polynomes. And, um, and it describes the angular momentum, um, the angular momentum exchange between these two orbits. So this was done back in the 60s by Kozai and Lidov separately. And what Kozai, for example, did, he took the um, um, he took this Hamiltonian expanded in semi-major axis ratio, just like this. Um, he did it with a pen and paper, which is pretty awesome. Uh, no Mathematica to check your minuses. He did this to this n to the power of six, which also pretty cool. Um, and then he said, well, you know what? Because I have the separation of uh, systems, what I can do, I can smash the mass around the orbit. And treat these two, um, these three systems, these three bodies, as two uh, wires that um, basically torque each other. So when we smash the mass around the orbit, it's called a secular approximation. Nothing interesting is happening on orbital time scale, and everything that is interesting happening on longer time scales through angular momentum exchange. So this orbit um, uh, and this orbit torque each other, and this is what this part represents. This uh, later perturbing part. Um, so when he does that, you integrate over the orbit, basically, and, um, and this is called, this is where it started, the cosine mechanism. And what he found is that if you start initially with an inclined orbit, such as this, uh, with a, such as this, sorry, you're less, you're less uh, eccentric, so more circular. And if you're less inclined, such as this, then you're more eccentric. So less circular and back and forth. And he found also some conserved parameter, which is the Z component of the angular momentum of the inner orbit. So here is, this is the orbital normal 
and I can project this to the Z component, and we choose the Z component to be the total angular momentum. Because this is this system is frankly symmetric, so the total angular momentum is conserved, right? Nothing torques it from outside, right? This is the only thing I have in my universe. So total angular momentum is conserved, and therefore I can choose it to be the Z component. And I can write angular momentum as one minus E squared. So when it's very eccentric, it's a radial motion. And this cosine i comes as a present from the uh, projection, right? So I'm projecting this into this z component. And he found that this is constant. And we can see this oscillation that I just described, less inclined, more eccentric. More inclined, less eccentric, right? If it's very eccentric, e is one. OK, this is what he found. However, we have shown um, that this is only true if the um, if one of the system, if one of the members of the inner orbit is a test particle, and if and only if the outer orbit is um, axisymmetric, for example, if it's circular. In every other case, that is not correct. There was some error in their early treatments, and um, and it really changed the way that the dynamics behave. So in general, what we have done is we redirived everything. And by the way, I'm condensing um, an hour long talk of, <laughs> of this thing, of this error um, here, and I'm just presenting this in this, um, in this manner. Um, so to, to, to have a very long story short, uh, we allowed both the Z component of the angular momentum of the inner and outer orbit. So it's the Z component and the angular momentum to change. That already happened in the lowest order of approximation. Remember, there's a perturbing function there that I'm expanding. And the lowest order of approximation called the quadruple level. But there are some problems with the quadruple level. So we move to the octuple level. By the way, this was done before us. It was also done correctly. However, I think there was this notion of this conserved parameter so deep embedded in the community mind that they've missed all the fun stuff that I'm going to show you. Um, and everything fun really happens in the optical level. So then both magnitude and orientation can change for the angular momentum. And we, it means that we can tap the large part of the parameter space. So some of the reasons that the quasi Rudolf mechanism was not widely um, used was because in the previous population, you really needed to fine tune the parameter space and have the two orbits almost perpendicular to one another. And if I need to find tuna in for anything interesting to happen, and if I need to find tuna the parameter space, then you know it's, it cannot really explain anything. But the point is that we can tap the large part of the parameter space if we're doing it this way. And the system is exciting, it's rich, it's chaotic. We can also flip systems from below 90 degrees to above 90 degrees, something that we couldn't do before with this conservation law because it, we couldn't change the sign of the cosine. And we can achieve extreme eccentricities, which is really important for us where we want to merge stuff. And we call it the eccentric cosine mechanism because the fun stuff happens when the outer orbit is eccentric. So here is an example. Um, I found, by the way, that showing a movie of the 3D behavior first doesn't project well in Zoom, and second, just confused. I think the Zoom is better. So here I'm showing the inclination. This is eccentricity as one minus e because we care about the pericenter passage as a function of time. And we can see those oscillations between um, inclination and eccentricity just as I predicted. But we can see that here it's below 90 degrees and here it's above 90 degrees. And just to make the point, this is the blue one is the 60s population. And you can see the qualitative difference between our population and what uh, what was the what people thought that the uh, that the dynamics is another interesting thing is um, is these very extreme eccentricities. This is uh, this eccentricity, the reaching such high eccentricity, is something that is very pervasive in the parameter space. So we don't need to fine tune the parameter space to get these extreme eccentricities. It's something that happens quite often very violently too. So that may be promising, maybe things will merge. So the question, will it merge? The answer is yes. 
So here I'm showing um, as a proof of concept, a work that was done by my student, Baumin Hong. And I'm showing here the inclination, one minus E, three major axis as a function of time. And you can see in blue is the six phase calculation and in red is R's. Here we include general relativity as the one, first post-Newtonian and then gravitational wave emission is 2.5 post-Newtonian. This is a, an example of a binary around a supermassive black hole. And you can see in the blue case, you no, know, this is the 60th calculation, nothing, um, nothing happened, it never merged. But in our case, we got a merger. Um, and then Baumin also ran a whole uh, Monte Carlo statistics and found that for a continuous star formation that can happen inside um, or near a supermassive black hole, we should get that the black hole black hole merger rate should be something like this. So this is one to 14 and the units are per volume per year. So now you may think to yourself, okay, fine, but you promised something about to talk about stars that evolve and, and can or cannot finish and become two black holes. So where are all this story? Right? In this story, we just we did some proof of concept. We started with two black holes. This is cheating in a way, right? So let's do this correctly. Um, so here is a um, I'm going to present a work by Alexander Stefan. And here I'm showing the evolution of two stars and um, in the center of a galaxy. And we include the eccentric cosi Lido, we include first post Newtonian. Oh, we also include this uh, 2.5. I forgot to add it here. We include tides. We include post-main sequence stellar evolution, both for the single and the binary. And that's really important because the stars evolve, they, um, the binary widen up and that really can change the evolution. So that's important to include. We also include the fact that the binary meets a lot of, a lot of flybys and that I can come too close to the supermassive black hole and being disruptive. And that allows us to follow stars from birth to old age and even death. And, um, and we can find white dwarfs and neutron stars and black holes. And here I'm showing the fraction of systems as a function of time that Alexander had in his uh, statistical Monte Carlo simulations. So we start with 100% binaries, right? And because we don't know how many binaries there are. So the natural thing is just to say, Let's assume that everything is in binaries. And if someone knows better, we can always calibrate that. So in birth, all the, all the stars begin with binaries. And then we have less and less binaries as time goes by. And this is in the blue because either they were unbound because of flybys or something else happened. And what happens is, and this is in the red, that two binaries met and merge, two stars and met and merge. And we can see here that this is the merger from fraction, right? So the eccentricity is so high that they meet each other. And this is happening before they became black holes. This is happening during main sequence time, right? So this is working against us to form black holes, but it's still very interesting because we can ask ourselves, um, what happened when two stars Neat. So it's a very, oh, is there a question? No. Okay. Um, so it's very interesting to think what happened when two stars meet. And here we have a, um, just a, an, an illustration. It's a very messy process. We have lots of dust and gas that is being thrown around. Um, and it's particularly interesting because of an interesting observation that was done in the center of the galaxy not too long ago. So about uh, 2012, there was an observation of a gas cloud that called the G2 object. And it seems like a gas cloud that is about to fall into the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. Now the media was really having a fist of it because they said, oh, we're going to see the supermassive black hole eat up something and it's going to be exciting. And there was a lot of uh, excitement in the, in the literature but then the damn thing survived. So it didn't, it didn't die, right? And you can calculate a gas cloud that passes so close to the supermassive black hole, which is about 150, 100 AU. It should have fallen in 
And in order not to fall and get disrupted, you can calculate what is the mass of such a thing to hold together and stay together. And it's a few solar mass. But this thing doesn't look like a few solar mass. It looks like a gas cloud. So what is going on? And by the way, here you can see another Miguel's um, connection. So there are lots of ideas, right? This is whenever there is a puzzle in astronomy, there'll be lots of people with lots of interesting ideas. So maybe it's a star with a protoplanetary disk, right? We know that there are lots of stars, lots of young stars. The estimation is that there are lots of young stars in the galactic center. Maybe there's a protoplanetary disk. Then I need to be somewhat lucky to observe the uh, IR from a protoplanetary disk. Or maybe it's a tidally disruptive star, and what we see is the remnant of it. And it's embedded in a bigger string that we don't see, and it holds all the um, it holds the pre the pressure holds this clump together. Or as we say, maybe it's a merger due to the eccentric cosi lead of mechanism. But we have a very significant um, uh, prediction, and that prediction is that there will be many of these. But we're going to have lots and lots and lots of these population because uh, ju not just one. And there are lots of other ideas that I'm not giving, uh, I'm not doing any, um, um, not being very nice to, uh, <laughs> not discussing everyone else. Um, so interestingly enough, there have been another observation. This one is called G1. And then we observe a population. So in total, there are, you know, it's less than 10, more than three, already a population in astronomy. Um, and it seems that it's consistent with, uh, with observations of a population of G2 life objects. Their eccentricity and orientation and, uh, in the galactic center seem to be consistent with our prediction, modulo the very small statistics that we have. So that is very ex exciting to think that there will be these objects that are there, and maybe we, they are connected to G2. So maybe these are indeed G2-like objects. But there are other objects here, right? These objects here that are about to be, um, to happen, something happen to them. But before that, I have to say something that I forgot, and I'm very happy that the, <laughs> that the animation popped up. Um, what happened when those, stars uh, finish their merging process, right? Merging process can take millions of years, but after it happens, what, I mean, after they are done, how would they look like? So maybe they'll look like young stars. It's like the ultimate facelift, right? They rejuvenated with, with hydrogen now. So maybe they can explain the young stars that we see in the galactic center. So we see, you see those stars here, this is the galactic center, maybe you've seen this animation before. This animation shows lots of young stars, about 6 million years, and it's a puzzle on how to get them to look so young. So maybe they're not really that young, they just look young because they got merged and became um, and rejuvenated with their hydrogen. So that is a possibility. Now, no matter what they are, they have to be there, right? Whether or not I connect them to be the G2 objects or the young stars, all I describe is just physics. And in physics predict that there'll be these merging objects. So they have to be there because I didn't, I didn't invoke any magic or anything like that. All right, so now I wanna focus on these ones here. These ones are um, something that happened when stellar evolution took place. Uh, so in this case, we have two stars that met each other and started to do something more complicated of, um, of basically some stellar, uh, some binary stellar evolution and mass transfer and something interesting. So we're going to focus on these ones here. And here is where uh, we can get all kinds of remnants like catalytic variables, binaries, and black hole, black holes, neutron star black holes, neutron star, neutron star, white dwarf binaries. And this is also where um, your new student, Cheryl Wang, has been uh, playing a major role, where she also used an updated binary stellar evolution uh, for different metallicities, because the hierarchical nature of galaxy formation means that at least at some point in time, or at least in early points in time, this 
place, galactic centers were in lower metallicity than the metallicity that we see today. So this is something that we can take into account in our evolution. And Cheryl took that into account. Um, so then, um, and I wanna emphasize all of this, Cheryl did as an undergrad and while working online. So just, just ponder on how awesome. Um, all right. So, um, so what Cheryl uh, found is that we can estimate the rates of these binaries. And for example, black hole, black hole rate is uh, updated from what we got before in our cheating way to one to 20 uh, per, uh, uh, per volume per year. And um, also she found, oops, oops, oh no. Also, she found neutron stars and white dwarfs. Sorry, all the animations are also going to repeat themselves. Uh, neutron star black holes and neutron star neutron star, which are late to come. Here we go. So now um, there is another interesting thing that Cheryl found that these black holes, for example, when they are way before they merge and way before LIGO finds them, they are just black holes in the center of a galaxy. And we may be able to see them using LISA. So LISA is going to be, um, hopefully will be out in 10 years, will be launched in 10 years, uh, hopefully. And LISA is going to be a space uh, detector. It's arms, right? If we compare LIGO arms, which is our for about four ki uh, kilometers, its arms are going to be 2.5 million kilometers. So it's it can, it can, um, it can find, it can detect objects in much lower frequencies. So here, what Cheryl is showing is the characteristic strain. So by how much the arm of Lisa had changed due to gravitational waves squeezing and expanding it and the frequency of the wave. And this, this uh, line is the estimated Lisa uh, sensitivity. So above it, we can see something and below it, we cannot. And then she estimated the, um, how we will be able to observe these black holes at the center of our galaxy, for example. And here are um, the gravitational wave signals, the envelope of those. And she estimated that will be about a factor of a 10 of black hole black holes that we may be able to observe um, from the eccentric causality of mechanism and many more white dwarf, white dwarf in our galactic center using LISA. So this happens way before they're merged with LIGO. Now we can also ask ourselves then, all right, so how many, um, how many LIGOs LIGO will observe? What will LIGO will see from this type of, uh, of a channel? So then um, I'm going to do something that is usually a big no-no in, um, in the way that we approach astronomy, but that there are some benefits that I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to compare different channels, right? There are lots of ideas in the, um, in the literature and I want to compare them. And I'm going to compare them to LIGO rate estimation. So LIGO estimate between 10 and 100 gigaparsec cube per gigaparsec cube per year of black hole, black hole binary merger. This is the rate that they estimate. I'm going to consider the different things. And the reason that I'm going to do it, even though it's a big no-no, um, it's because it has, it's going to put things into context for us. So where we can expect things to happen in the, um, in the galaxy or in a galaxy. So here is what I described to you so far. So we, we described this rate between one and 20 gigaparsec uh, cube per year. Oh, there is a question. There is a question in the YouTube chat. Does Sagittarius A affect the dynamics of the binary? Yeah, so Sagittarius A star is the supermassive black hole and it torques the binary, right? It torques the binary evolution. And, um, and this is the entire eccentric cosine lead of mechanism. Um, I don't know if it's able, if we're able to, uh, to project the answer back or maybe they, oh, it's in, they saw them. <laughs> How about we'll see if they answer, <laughs> if, they, if this answer satisfied them. And if not, please write to me and I'll know. Um, so this rate comes because the supermassive black hole torques and, and excite high eccentricities in the, in, the, in the smaller black holes and merge them together. And this is the rate. 
And then um, this is a very lower limit because there are other mechanisms that can actually help. We can have triples in this place and we can have the hard binaries. Remember I looked at the wide binaries? We can have tighter binaries that can also merge. And now I'm going to add stuff. And this is where the known rule comes. So, you know, um, it's never a good idea to add order of magnitude uh, numbers because you'll get an order of magnitude answer. And this is what we will get. We will get an order of magnitude <laughs> answer. Um, but it will be uh, informative anyways. So I'm going to add just collisions. If I have just black holes that somehow uh, did not stay in its binary companion initially, and another black hole, they may find each other and merge, and this is the rate that is expected for them. Then I can go further out and look at, um, at the bar, and the bar is an asymmetric potential or any asymmetry potential can create um, behavior that is very similar to the eccentric cosine widow, the dynamics just since that, and this is the rate for them. Then we can go to the global load clusters and see what is the estimation for global load clusters. And maybe you know, they can explain between five to 50, but maybe even all, that's a nice idea. And then we add it and we get the exact same rate of uh, LIGO. And of course, it's not surprising because we added orders of magnitude. Here was the smallest, so we got the smallest, and here was the largest, and we got the largest, so it's not surprising. That was not the point. The point was to see where things lie and also to see if we're even close enough in dynamical channels to be competitive. And it seems that we are. I should also mention that there are a lot of other ideas from primordial black holes that I haven't talked about to black holes merging in um, galactic nuclei disks, which I didn't talk, and also in isolated binaries and triples in the field. So there are lots of ideas. And I think it shows how um, fruitful and exciting this field is. And I think that the fact that everyone can come and with different ideas is um, just say something about uh, how, um, you know, how, the, how people think in different directions. But I really believe that our job is to come with ways to disentangle the, these many channels. So there are many, many channels, which is awesome. But our job is not to really add them all and say, yay. But our job is to come and say, can we give different predictions? So given the time, I will, I will only present one, uh, one possibility, and I'm going to be uh, highlighting our work. But there are many ideas in the literature how to get different predictions in diff uh, from the different channels and hopefully to start to disentangle this parameter space. <laughs> so I'm going to present uh, the work done by one of my students, Bao Ming Hong, and this really highlights one of the hallmark behavior of, um, of COSI. So what COSI is doing is really changing the eccentricity, these oscillations of back and forth eccentricity as due to perturbations from the supermassive black hole. And we say that you can see it in LISA. So here I'm showing the characteristic strain again by how much the LISA arm is changing due to gravitational wave um, interaction with gravitational wave that's expanding it and, and contracting it as a function of the frequency. This is the um, gravitational, this is LISA sensitivity curve. So above it, you, you can see something, below it, you cannot. And here in the top panel, I'm showing a behavior of the eccentricity of a system as a function of time. And the eccentricity is changing due to perturbation from the supermassive black hole. And what you're going to see, you're going to see the gravitational wave signal in the LISA band, and you're going to see it moves back and forth as the eccentricity is changing as a function of time. So this is the movie. It comes back and forth, back and forth. I can pause the movie in case you don't see it very well. And here you can see it going back and forth. These different, um, these different lines correspond to the lines here in the eccentricity time evolution. And that happens, it can only happen the, this back and forth due to cosine. If it would have been merging, it would go to this direction. 
to this direction and it will disappear to the high frequencies. But going down in frequencies, that can only happen due to cosine. So that's a very distinct behavior. And it's not just because of a supermassive black hole, it's whatever tertiary that you want to have. This is the behavior that it will produce um, going back and forth. In addition to this, there is also, of course, inclination that will take place, which um, we didn't show here, but it's the exact same uh, calculation. So that is something that is very distinct to cosine. All right, so I'll, I think I'll jump to the end um, to allow people have questions because no one asked me any questions during the talk. Um, so I think what I showed is that we, it's really important to have a, at least social distance friend, um, especially in the context of merging black holes. So for example, we saw that supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies can help merge black holes, neutron stars, and white dwarfs. We saw that we can maybe detect them in LISA and that we are able to disentangle at least this type of channel from other channels. Along the way, we found really cool things. For example, we found gas clouds that are not really gas clouds. They are in the skies, stars in the skies, and also young stars that are not really young stars are also disguising themselves. And that's it. I'll be more than happy to answer questions. All right, thank you, Smadar, and I'll clap for everyone else. And uh, questions? Tim? Hi, yeah, that was um, fascinating. So thanks for the great talk. I'm just wondering, maybe you mentioned this, I might've missed it, um, but I'm wondering some of the results you quoted from your Monte Carlo calculations. I'm wondering about the initial distributions of some parameters, like I'm thinking like the internal distance between uh, members of a binary or the number density of binaries as a function of radial distance. Um, like, is that, does, are, do these matter? Do, are your results sensitive to those, to those assumptions or maybe it doesn't matter at all or? It's an excellent question. Thank you very much for asking. Um, so there is a pre, um, there was a pre-notion in, um, in the community that the cosine mechanism is really sensitive to initial conditions. So I'm extremely happy that you asked these questions because it doesn't matter at all and we have tested it to verify that indeed it doesn't matter as we expect. And I'll explain why. Because, so first of all, how do we choose our initial conditions? We chose our initial conditions for the um, distribution of the inner orbit. We chose it, um, we usually choose it from Dukan mayor distribution, which is a log normal. And we cut all those that are unstable. So those that are becoming hill, um, for example, they have some hill, um, hill mechanism, the hills mechanism that works on them or that they violate stability criteria that uh, disallow us to separate the two scales. But even if it's not log normal distribution, if you assume a parallel, which we tried, it gives the same answer. Additionally, to how to distribute this along the, uh, around the supermassive black hole, how to distribute the binaries, we tried different things. For example, we tried um, very popular distribution, which called Bacol wolf which means that the density goes like, um, um, this, the distance to the power of, um, of the power law of seven fourth. This describes, um, this describes uh, an equilibrium in energies in, the, in a galactic center, for example. Um, but we also tried the spherical distribution um, and a power law of two and three and one. And the reason that none of this is, it matters is because when I populate, so I have a, a, I have a probability to populate them, um, to have a system which is um, in the right place somewhere, right? So maybe it will not be here, maybe it will be here, but then it will be in the right uh, position. So overall, the fraction of systems that will undergo COSI is almost constant. Um, so that in, in this case, it didn't matter. We also tried another thing in this. Um, so I, I don't have on me on the, all these plots. So I cannot, so this is why I'm using my hands. But the plot that I do have um, is uh, here. And you can see that there is a dashed, there is a dashed line here. So we also included tides. And there is another question, how effective the tides should be. And you can see that um, we 
change the, the how the uh, how effective tides are, and it didn't matter so much. Only here, just by a little bit. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. That's uh, really interesting. Cool. My pleasure. All right, Daryl. Hi, Smidar. Thank you for the awesome talk. Thanks, Eve. Um, I am wondering, so this is a little bit of a broad question, but of course, as you know, I'm really interested in the connections between electromagnetic and gravitational radiation for some of these kinds of sources. And so I'm wondering about both of those populations you highlighted, both the double white dwarfs and also the black holes, whether or not as you all have worked on these sort of theoretical uh, formation channels and thinking about rates, um, whether you've thought about any observations we can take in advance of LISA to try to narrow down some of the possibilities for those formation channels or maybe in the era of LISA, which complementary observations would be most telling. So broad question, but if you have thoughts on that, I'd love to hear them. Yes, definitely. So we predict lots of catalytic variables. And I think these are things that can be um, observed. Already some have been observed, I think. Or there are ideas that the X-ray, that some of the X-ray signatures that are seen in the center of the galaxies are due to catalytic variables. And um, it seems consistent. And that is actually an interesting cornerstone to estimate the, um, the number of white dwarfs in general. In, a, in our galactic center and to see whether or not it's consistent. And you know, because you have some distribution which is really sensitive to, um, um, it's really sensitive to what you don't know about <laughs> the, the initial mass function, right? So you can actually try to, um, to use that to calibrate because that gives you some idea on the, um, on the, on the, um, on, on, on the slope in a, in a sense because of the because of the um, because of the white dwarfs. So we used saltpeter, which is uh, the most vanilla way to uh, to adopt this. Had we used uh, top heavy as many uh, as many uh, works suggest that the, uh, that the IMF is top heavy in the galactic center, we would have gotten even more black holes. But it, this is where I actually think that going very conservative initially is good in this in this case, because we were able to get a significant number of black holes and numbers of um, of um, of white dwarfs or catalytic variables that seems consistent with observations. Again, seems is up to an order of magnitude because the observations themselves are also up to an order of magnitude. Um, but I think it's a start to try to, um, to calibrate this IMF. So I think that makes a, an interesting, right? We, we expect those mergers to happen no matter what, but the question is how many will be black holes? How many will be white dwarfs? This is a question that is a, an open question in my, in my mind. This is one answer. Another thing is low mass X-ray binaries. So we were able to form some low, low mass X-ray binaries some of there are some ideas that low mass X-ray binaries are formed um, frequently through um, through a black hole, single black hole meeting a star, and that can also happen. But that will be an interesting, a different type of because um, it will come with a relative faster velocity than the velocities that our low mass X-ray binaries are coming. So a question to ask is what will be those signatures? Will it be um, Will it be long lasting low mass X-ray binaries or will it be um, a flash and then quiet and then a flash, right? Because it's a very wide orbit. So it's an interesting question to try to, uh, to understand what are these two, and, and these are basically markers along the way, right? Because they are all coming from the same behavior. So, I mean, I would love, I, I think that you and I have talked about this quite often about how we can try to, um, to really pinpoint how we, uh, the, the, the right predictions that are also attainable within our lifetime. So I would love to continue this discussion with you offline. Awesome, thank you. All right, so I think our time's up before Smadar goes to the meeting with the students. So let's thank Smadar again for the excellent talk. I'll clap for everyone again. 
have a good day, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming and stay safe. Great, Smanar. Good to see you. You too.